Good afternoon, happy Saturday, keepers of the cash. Gary B, the casual comic guy here. We're here with Savage Saturday, comic review, episode 96. We're closing in on that 100 mark, and I couldn't be happier about it. I love that this little niche show has its niche audience, and uh, it's been a fantastic, fun journey. And I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. Today, though, today we're going to talk about a new story that's out, and also a fantastic creator that's as important to the genre as... You could argue H.R. Giger is to the Alien franchise, right? So we, of course, are going to review today issue number one of Dawn Attack. And, of course, I have the Frank Frazetta cover, but that cover doesn't stop there. Um, I got a few more covers waiting for me at my LCS, but I did not want to wait to do the review before I um, got those covers. So there you go. There is a full cover of Dawn Attack by Frank Frazetta. Now, Dawn Attack, of course, most like, mostly a military term. You uh, move in during the night and attack at first light for a surprise strategy. And, uh, of course, depicted very well on this cover for the sci-fi setting it's in. So, let's talk about Frank Frazetta for a moment, right? And we'll, then we'll get to that story review. An icon and, of course, a master. But to call him a master of um, what he did... I think is even giving him not enough credit, right? Uh, this guy was just the best at what he did, bar none. And as important to the genre of sci-fi, fantasy, and even horror as um, H.R. Giger was to the alien and sci-fi um, franchises and genre, right? Because both of these artists are synonymous with these genres. Now, Conan the Barbarian has been a character that you guys know is a staple of this channel, right? It's what Savage Saturday Comic Review started on. It's what it's still mostly based on. <clears throat> and Conan has had a few revivals in its storied history, right? This IP. Uh, and one of those great revivals was in the Lancer books put out uh, starting in 1966 with Conan the Adventurer, where you can see the Barbarian cover there by Frank Frazetta. And... Um, <laughs> You could argue that he was as much a part of reviving Conan as well as the stories and literature that Lancer was uh, republishing, right? And those covers drew people to the stories. Uh, the covers themselves tell a story. There's a depth to the covers. There's a gritty realism to the covers. But there's also that fantastical element, that sci-fi element, and that touch of imagination which just draws you in on so many different levels. So, uh, a talent beyond compare, definitely. But uh, it all began, for me, with this 1966 Conan, right? Now, this came out before I was born. I was born in 1970. But after Roy Thomas introduced me to Conan, and I went and found, started gathering these old books, the next thing you learn about, besides Robert E. Howard, is Frank Frazetta and his influence on the genre. Because it, it can't be... It can't be overstated, I think, how important his artwork was to reviving this property, this IP. But it wasn't just Conan, right? And then again, used again on the adventure when it went to the Ace Books. But <clears throat> just absolutely amazing art. Super important to the genre. And as much a part of the revival of that property due to the quality of the painting as the quality of the storytelling, in my opinion, right? Because I don't think Conan takes off again like it did in 1966 without those Frazetta covers drawing, drawing the common crowd in to discover the fantastic Robert E. Howard stories within. And then again, another resurgence when Roy Thomas acquired the property for Marvel Comics. But he did a lot more than Conan, right? Uh, you know, he tackled John Carter of Mars. He tackled Tarzan. He tackled many sci-fi, fantasy, and horror genres in his paintings, which were incredible. And Opus is doing a Frazettaverse. Uh, they started with The Death Dealer. Really fun book. Really enjoying it quite a bit. And now the next part of that Frazettaverse, uh, brought to you by the Frazetta Girls, of course, 
who are doing an excellent job of keeping the legacy of Frazetta going alive and well. Uh, they know how important he is to the genre. And Dot Attack is another great entry into this world that Frank Frazetta created through his paintings. Now, Dot Attack is an absolutely fantastic first read. I loved going through it. So our first, our character, of course, is the character on the cover. She's our main protagonist. And they just take the name from the uh, name of the painting. So her name is Dawn. And when Dawn was a child, her father moved her and her people to another place to live so they could survive. But it hasn't been easy. They're short on resources. They're short on supplies. They're short on just about everything they need to survive. And it's dwindling year by year. And her father sets out to other worlds to try to find them a new home and find them resources and bring resources back. But it's been many years now since her father's been gone. Donna is now an adult. She's left in charge. And she's a reluctant ruler in her own world. And she's... Um, she goes out, she hunts, she provides, she does what she can for her people. All the while, trying to still find her father, hoping he's okay, hoping that something didn't happen. And uh, this recounts that. So, of course, we had the Frazetta cover. There's a Dan Panosian cover. Now, I'm going to show the different covers over here for you guys. That way, you get a look at the fantastic art that's being done in this series. So, we have a script by Jody Hauser and Eric Campbell. And uh, it's a fun script. I can't say I've read anything. I may have read a Jody Hauser um, Stranger Things miniseries, I think. But uh, not super familiar. So, but I was really impressed with this issue. Art by Diego Yepur. And um, just the art is fantastic. It really sets the tone for this book. As well as the writing. And I think it's very complimentary to what Frazetta first put out in the Dawn Attack poster. I think it pays a lot of respect to that painting. All right, so our story opens up. You have a predator. You have right there and another predator going up the food chain to uh, attack and eat that, who is in turn confronted by Dawn, who says, you took my prey and proceeds to slaughter that uh, ape man right there. And we get a good savage introduction to Dawn. Now she has a blaster and a sword, but her blaster malfunctions and she's forced to take care of him with the sword. And you get a nice, good um, introduction to Dawn here. She's just going about her business, not deterred. Uh, she doesn't get um, upset. She doesn't get scared. She's just, um, she said, uh, sorry, I never quite learned how to speak Demon Howling. I'll assume you're saying goodbye. And with that, she lops off its head. She's uh, very nonchalant about going about her slaying and providing for her people. And then our next page shows her um, cutting the beast open, getting the, getting the meat to return home. And you see the barren landscape she's going through. And she's also talking uh, to a guy named Tom, T-H-O-M. And again, look at the beautiful art. Really telling the story beautifully. Opus is doing a great job with the Frazetta stuff as uh, um, combined with the Frazetta girls bringing the property to Opus. So really, really great work all around and a great collaboration. And um, he, he answers her, nothing today, princess. Skies are clear as ever. She goes, well, if not today, then very soon I can feel it. He'll need us to be ready to guide the ship's approach for landing. This guy's kind of tuned out. He's like, yeah, sure, princess, any day now. He doesn't believe that her father, the king, is coming back and that she's going to be stuck in ruling. <clears throat> and there's kind of um, this feeling of oppression there, not, not, from, not from her, not from other people, just from the circumstances that they're in, right? Uh, there's not a lot of food, and they, the, they do a really good job through storytelling of showing you What's going on in this little in this city, right? Uh, you have a little boy asking a merchant for bread. She's like, "Sorry, love, should have more flour ground in a day or two. And you have an old man uh, telling another young kid. He goes, "No, that's for you. That's for you, lad. You're still the one growing. An old man like me doesn't need more than a few bites. 
So you can you get the sense through the through the interactions, through dialogue, through through really good uh, succinct storytelling that this is a place full of good people, but they are going through some really hard times, some oppressive times, and you get the sense that they don't know how they're going to come out the other side. And <clears throat> these are Don's people. Uh, she is a reluctant ruler, as I stated, and she is just doesn't know what to do about it. She's waiting for the answer to come from her dad when he returns, but he's been gone a couple years. There's no sense that he may return. Once she gets back in, uh, she starts talking to her uh, her commander in arms, and um, they're talking about the attack of the, uh, of the eight people coming close. She goes, I killed it long before it found the camp, Ferris. And he's like, you stopped the first drop of rain. What, happen, what happens when the storm comes? If they're venturing this far from their territory, and she's like, it's not their territory. He says, I saw blood on your boot when you came in. You had to use your sword again, didn't you? She says, I'm good with the sword. He's like, amazing even, but you're even better with a blaster. It malfunctioned again, didn't it? And this is another part of the storytelling that's really functioning well, right? So you, they have technology. They don't have the technology they had from their original home. The technology they have is failing them here and there. Uh, they have barely enough provisions to keep repairing this technology. So this is a civilization on the uh, crumbling right now. It's on the downturn. They need they need to win. They need something to turn it around for them. And she goes, so I'll repair it again. And he's like, look, I'm not worried about you. He goes, I worry about the reliability of the blasters for those among us who can't wield a sword like you can. And that's everybody there, right? And... Uh, She's saying, you know, when my father returns, none of this will be a concern. Technology, allies, whatever it is we need, he'll find it. And he's he's just, he's trying to be real with her. But he knows when there's someone that you love and they're out there and you haven't heard from them, if you're the one that's closest to him, you are always got that hope out. He's being more of a realist. He's like, it's been over two years. We have to make preparations just in case. And she's like, in case he doesn't come back. And he does a good, good job of like kind of, Shining it over, he goes, in case he doesn't come back in time. <clears throat> As your military advisor, I'd be derelict in my duty if I didn't point out that we need a plan. He goes, I know you don't want this. You never have, but you're our leader, Don. And so, just the setup is really good. Like I said, for, for never having read Jody Hauser, I'm pretty impressed uh, with this. And I shouldn't just say Jody Hauser. Jody Hauser and Eric Campbell. Um, I'm, I was really impressed with this issue. The setup is phenomenal. And then we kind of get a flashback of her training with her dad, her dad in his suit before he's, uh, you know, he's gone out on many journeys. She's already become quite adept at the sword. And when he comes back, you know, she meets him and as a kid, you know, she's like, Papa, Papa. And he hugs her. And he, he calls her my little sunrise. And she goes, um, I need a bigger sword. And he goes, ha, huh, not even out of the suit, and you're already asking me for new weapons. Whatever happened to Hello, Father, I miss you. How did the battle go? And she goes, why should I ask you how the battle went? You always win. But is this, since her father hasn't returned, is this the one time he didn't win? And what does that mean for Don going forward as a leader? So we go back to the modern time with in Don's age. And... She's just telling she's telling Ferris that they're gonna have to make do until they can reclaim their true home. And um, she says, We may not have the kind of tech we had in our youth, but at least we have the means to maintain what's left of it. And he says, and uh, Ferris says, If our fate depends on my sister, then we are truly doomed. And that's when we meet his sister, who is in charge of taking care of their tech. Uh, and then his sister lets out that she's in possession of something that she hasn't told either the brother or Don about yet. And uh, Don cannot wait to see what it is. And um, once they find out, she takes Don out there and she sees that she has some of the, some of the mechanics left from where her father set out. They found a down ship. And she also has the ship and she's repairing it. And Don is just completely bought by, caught by surprise. 
And she goes, you know where they are? My father's army? And she says, no, I, I found it on a salvaging run. No sign of any other parts like it. And believe me, I really, really looked. She goes, I suspected it might be from one of the automatons, from the stories you both told me. That level of technology is so far beyond the rest of this junk. The problem is that so little data survived. From the heroic age, their ship computers alone are. She goes, how do you know about their ship computers? And that's when she looks at it out of the bag that she found the ship. And on the ship, his sister, she's like, I haven't messed with the computer systems much, but the commands were easy enough to work out. It flies. If the old stories are true, it can do a lot more than that. There's something else. You two need to see this, especially you, Don. This has been on a display since I got the power working a couple of months ago. And um, so we go there where she's bringing Don on the ship. And again, great panel art. Moving the story along briskly, as is the dialogue and the storytelling. Just a super fun read. Um, and she goes, it looks like this screen shows all of the ships in the same group. And I think the green one is your father's ship. That information looks like a flight pan, flight path. I know what you're thinking, love. Um, is, and uh, that's Ferris talking. Because her and Ferris, they're, they're a couple, right? And he's like, but you've never flown anything like this before. It's far too dangerous. And she says, more dangerous than ignoring our plight here. Like now our people slowly starve to death. We don't know what he's found out there that could help us. Besides, it was the only one who was, he was the only one who was ever able to control the automaton army. If we can find them. And he's like, how long can you be sure he'll, he's still alive? Do you think he would already have returned if he could? Is it really worth the risk? This thing could kill you. And she's like, he's not just our king, Ferris. He's my father. If there was even a sliver of the chance that your father was still alive, wouldn't you go? And of course he would. So... She makes a plan. Uh, you know, Ferris and his sister are going to help her get this thing going. She goes and meets with the people and says that she is striking out to find her father. And short of finding her father, come back with something to help them. And she is preparing to leave. Now, the people love her. And she is just, uh, we get a nice little moment after she announces. We get her and Ferris just having a nice little intimate scene talking really helps you connect with the characters. You see how much they care about each other. You see how much they care about the people that they are duty bound to. And it's a nice little setup scene. It really makes you connect with them on, on a personal level. And she is the next morning just dumbfounded by all the people that come out to greet her. And they're all like, safe journey, princess. May the stars guide you to our king. Please return safely, highness. And she says, I didn't expect so many to see me off. And Ferris is like, you mean the world to them. If they're having any second thought, if you're having any second thoughts about, and she gives him a kiss, and she goes, I have to, my love, but I will return, I promise. And the, the journey is about to be set up. And as we go, we see one final launch, her going off into space to track along her father's flight plan path. And she gets one view of the world she's on, and she's like, wow, it's beautiful. And then she's like, remember why you're here, Don. I'm on my way, Father. Wherever you are, I'll find you. And thus concludes our first issue. Now, this is an adaptation that I just thought was very respectfully done. We got our little next issue teaser. And uh, the artwork of the other covers in the back. Again, the Don Attacks post, Don Attack poster and uh just just beautiful stuff this i thought was a great and respectfully done adaptation uh derived from this frank frazetta painting which is just a classic there's others in the series and it's just it's just gorgeous right the the painting itself is is incredible the story is great i'm going to give this introductory issue an a for storytelling i'm going to give it an a for art because the art really accented the story and not only that it still felt like you were firmly in the frazetta verse right um it really felt like a piece of what he carved out in this painting you could see the leap they made from and this is what was special about frank frazetta's work right you could see a painting of his and it creates a whole world in your mind from it. It's just intricate, incredible work done. And I thought this was a great homage to that. I thought it was really respectfully done. 
I don't have anything but A, A plus to say about this issue. It was a great introduction to this character, Don. A great introduction into the world. And I can't wait to see where it goes from here. If you guys were on the fence about checking this out, I'd say jump right into it. I found it fantastic. And um, I'm looking forward to the next issues. If you guys are curious about me reviewing the issues as they come out and want me to feature them on Savage Saturday Comic Review, let me know in the comments below and I'll feature the, it's a five issue mini series. It's going to tell a story and I can't wait to get through that story and see what they do with it. Because if the first issue is any indication, we're in for one fantastic ride created from the mind of Frank Frazetta as adapted by these beautiful people here into one great tale. But that's it for now. Until next time, keep it casual. Attention all, use channel sponsor Rogue Trader at theroguetraderutah.com and my code, keep it casual, for 10% off your comic cleaning and pressing needs. Remember, when submitting your books to be graded, use a trusted professional.